All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. On behalf of all of us behind the scenes here at Fourth Space, welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion, the Six versus Raf Keb State of the Scenes panel. We are coming to you live from Concordia University's Fourth Space, located on unceded Indigenous lands in Tajage, Montreal. As caretakers for the lands and waters we are meeting on, we are grateful to the Ganakahaga Nation for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, we work to connect people to the initiatives, research projects, and dialogues happening across the university. So we are pleased to have the opportunity to collaborate with CJLO on this panel, which will compare and contrast the hip hop scenes in Toronto and Montreal. We are running this as a meeting, so we welcome your comments via the chat or with a raised hand. It's now my pleasure to pass it over to you, Francella. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Francella. I'm the station Sorry. manager. It's OK. I'm the station manager at CJLO 1690 AM. CJLO is Concordia University's radio station. Uh, we are open and available to all Concordia community members. So whether you're an undergraduate student or graduate student, faculty member, staff member, CJLO is open for you. We're also open to all members of the community. So if you have any interest in radio, broadcasting, podcasting, music, CJLO is here for you. And right now uh, we're actually having a very special week this week. Uh, we call it Hip Hop for Life and uh, we celebrate that by playing nothing or basically mostly uh, hip hop and rap music, soul R&B on our airwaves. We do this with a variety of genres uh, throughout the summer. In April, we did uh, ambient April and then we also have a celebration of world music and jazz and blues music that comes later in the summer. So this is something that's a part of our Hip Hop for Life week. Uh, and it is steered by our hip hop music director, Megan Dams, who put this panel together. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Megan. But uh, yes, thank you for having CJLO 1690 AM. We're, we're thrilled to be working with Flip Space once again. Yeah, thank you for that, Francella. Thank you, um, Fourth Space. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you also to um, our panelists. Um, I guess I should just get right into it, introduce uh, myself. My name is Megan Dams. I am the hip hop slash R&B soul uh, music director at CJLO 1690 AM. Uh, I also have my own show at the station where I play like mainly hip hop, well, probably more R&B, but uh, like hip hop um, soul as well. Um, but I did not grow up in Montreal. I'm actually from Toronto. I grew up just outside of Toronto. So I think I have a unique perspective like in some ways I can sort of speak to both scenes like growing up just outside of Toronto being surrounded by like you know huge like Toronto hip-hop artists and that kind of scene but then coming to Montreal and then working like more in the in the music like the hip-hop music industry um, in Montreal through radio and through uh, my show and connecting with artists and stuff um, so I think that is everything oh yeah I'll give a little rundown just my sort of vision you know, for the panel, my idea for this was not to say like, or try and figure out which scene is better, which scene has better artists or is pushing out better music. That's not a, a, a conversation that I feel like there's any point in having. Um, really, I just wanted to compare the scenes. And I mean, that can be a lot of different things sonically in terms of like who people are inspired by, um, navigating the industry, both as an artist and then as, as someone who like works, you know, in the industry, whether in radio or label or media um, or something like that, the financial viability of each city, all that, uh, all that kind of stuff. So that, that's kind of my, um, my vision for this panel. Um, and I think we can go ahead and uh, get started. So um, yeah, because I work in radio in Montreal, uh, first of all, I said, okay, well, we need someone in radio who is from Toronto who can speak to that scene. Uh, so first of all, Adriel, um, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Adriel Smiley. I'm from CJRU 1280 in Toronto. I'm a journalist, radio host. I host The Cool Table, which is a show that um, spans across all genres. We focus on new music, so music that's come out in the last week, 10 days. That's what we focus on. We interview artists um, in Toronto and across Canada. And as well, I write, um, you know, on music across Canada as well. 
Perfect. Uh, the next person. So um, I play like obviously, I mean, Concordia is obviously English speaking uh, university. The majority of the music that we play um, is English. But of course, one of the really unique things about Montreal is the French influence and that we have an English team, but we also have a few, uh, like a huge um, French scene as well. And that's not something I know a ton about, but I knew someone who would know a ton about that. Uh, Steve, if you can introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Steve uh, Jolin. I work with, uh, actually I founded the, the label called Setsim Ciel, which is pretty much the biggest uh, francophone rap uh, hip hop label in uh, in Quebec. I, uh, I'm gonna say in North America, I, I could say. Um, so yeah, we've been, I've been doing this for uh, 20 years now. And uh, we represent like, Artists like Soldier, Corias, um, Dramatic, uh, Fouki. So some of the biggest names in uh, francophone rap in, uh, in Montreal. Yeah. Great. So the other thing I said, okay, we need English, we need Toronto, we need Montreal, we need English, we need French, but also not just industry perspective. Obviously, a huge part of this, we need like an artist perspective as well. So Patrick, if you can introduce yourself now. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Patrick Cabongo. I'm a songwriter, rapper, creative director uh, from Toronto, currently based out of Montreal. I'm also the CEO at Excellent Entertainment, which is a music agency which helps develop and uh, do project management for artists. And yeah, that's a little bit about myself. So you, um, I know I discussed this with you earlier, but you kind of go, you straddle between like both the Toronto and Montreal scenes as an artist. So you feel that you can like sort of speak to both, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. Perfect. So I'm just going to get right into the questions. I mean, I have a feeling that we all have a lot to say, a lot of opinions, a lot to get to. Um, so let me go with our very first question. This is super open-ended. And also these first ones are open for anyone who uh, wants to answer, probably everyone. Um, but what are the biggest differences between the Toronto and Montreal hip hop scenes? So this could be anything. This could be sonically, in mentality, in terms of approach, who artists are, in, uh, you know, influenced by, um, it, like more industry kind of stuff. This can be absolutely everything. From your perspective, what is the biggest difference? Anyone can go ahead first. I, I want to respect Steve and give the OG the, the, the right to speak first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, on my part, of course, if we, um, I'll say, if we, we, we talk about the language, that, that could be, uh, I mean, there's a scene in Montreal that we have our own star system, if, if I could say that, like in the, um, on the Francophone side. So, uh, of course, um, that's that's the, the number one thing, I'd say. Um, but also, I think, you know, um, Montreal hip hop scene is uh, pretty young. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, um, we know in Toronto, you know, things are going right now. And, and I think the, the come up of, of Drake, of, of The Weeknd uh, and Pressa and, and all these guys, you know, they made, they, they really put Toronto on the map. Um, and... And that has not been done right now in Montreal. We have not like one uh, artist that really uh, pop to uh, to make to have Montreal on a map. So we're still waiting on, on that one. But uh, we have Sarah, like a, a very um, healthy scene, uh, I could say. But um, but I'd say uh, I th I feel that we're in a, a good spot right now in Montreal in terms of. Uh, of producers we have these these guys like Katronada that's doing really well and all that but I mean um on the produ producer side I think we have some some uh great producers but uh it's a rapper or or artist that that blew up um we're still waiting right now but we're working on it we're working on it. <laughs> um I definitely agree with a lot of a lot of stuff uh, that that Steve is saying I think if I can start with the Toronto place, I think um, it's hip hop sound evolved a lot faster than Montreal's. I think um, they really got accustomed to that melodic hip hop, melodic trap sound that you find in Atlanta um, that kind of converted itself to Toronto. The, the imagery of Chicago kind of followed itself in Toronto. And I think we adapted to it a lot faster. And so if you're in Toronto now, hip hop 
Um, and what's popular does not sound like what we would identify as the source of hip hop. Um, but in Montreal, you can find those open sources a lot faster. Like you'll have guys like A La Claire Ensemble that they're really, like they're the source of that and they have a twist to it. There's more warping done, I think, in the source of hip hop here. And I think Montreal, in agreement with what he was saying about the language, I think the dominantly French speaking community audience hasn't yet fully um, devoted their time to, I guess, the English community, which typically will get a little bit more um, attention because of the language. It's easier to, to share across the border. But I think once, because I think about artists, like, for example, like when I think of rappers, I, I, first thing I think of is like Nate Husser or uh, Chris's Spirit, those kind of guys. But I agree that they haven't gotten that. I think once they get that full support, like Steve was saying, once they harbor that all together, I think artists like that are going to be able to put Montreal on the map. But in the same way, I think the main part is just the musical structure, like the infrastructure, how it's put together. I think Montreal has a, a lot of history with that kind of folk pop music. Like you think of people like Charlotte Cardin, uh, Ghostly Kisses, that identifies more with the culture, the Quebec culture. So I think it's easier to do that. But then you have guys like Loud, uh, you know, um, Larry, all these different guys that are the source of that hip hop. So I think I can't say there's a huge discrepancy sonically. I think it's more so about the community and how they translate that support to um, feeling that sense of belonging. And I think Toronto has that sense of belonging a lot because we're closer to, to the States. You know, um, when you think about like neighborhoods and all those things, the history is just kind of generated a little bit the same. And so I think that would be one of the main differences that, that, that are there between Toronto and Montreal. Adriel? Yeah, I, I would say as well, it's, it's the stories. I think that the Toronto story of the culture and the neighborhood is something people are more familiar with. And I think that that version of what it is in Montreal is something that people are just extremely unaware of. Um, mm -hmm. I spoke to Cadence Weapon a few years ago. He's from Edmonton, but he talked about how he spent six months in Montreal working on an album. And he, he just learned all these things at Montreal. He had no idea about what artists he never even knew lived in Montreal, didn't know they were from there. And this is someone who he's been touring for 15 years or so. Yeah. So I think that just the idea of people are, are really unaware of what it means to be from Montreal in whatever way they see, whether it's accurate or not, they don't even yeah. have an idea um, of what that is. And I think the Toronto story for a lot of artists, whether it's the street artists or the ones who are you know, more lyrical, people have an idea of, okay, I get this Toronto story. I can kind of understand what this is about. And I think that's the main difference between the two. And I, and I think like, dare I say, well, I think it's obvious. I think maybe people from Toronto or based out of Toronto are more likely to rep their scene and talk about being a Toronto artist, but people from Montreal just might not say so. Maybe it's not as on the map. Maybe it doesn't have the sort of presence in hip hop or the cool factor, whatever. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of artists like from Montreal who a lot of people don't know are um, from Montreal. Speaking of what you guys are saying though, in terms of the big thing that I've notice in terms of sound like as the um the hip-hop director at cjlo i'm always getting music sent to me you know like from not just canadian artists all over the world from artists themselves from labels pr companies uh whatever and the thing with um toronto is that the vast majority of the time like i won't even read the email i'll just click on the the link hear the song 90 percent of the time i can hear that it's from toronto like like truly, like I can just hear. And sometimes I can even tell like what neighborhood they're from, you know, like, um, like uh, I think Patrick, you said, um, that's a great way of describing it. Like the melodic kind of moody, like mm. production and like sort of R&B influence too. And like very heavy on like creating an atmosphere. I'm like, I can, I, I listen to it. I'm like, there's, there's absolutely no chance that this is not from Toronto. And I Google them and of course they're from Toronto. However, Montreal, I never know what I'm going to get. Like Montreal doesn't have a defined sound. And I actually think that's really cool. Like there's a lot more. And of course, it's not to say that all artists in Toronto have fit into that sound. Obviously they don't. But in Montreal, when, I, when I'm when i sent like a hip hop song or an R&B song from Montreal, I have no idea what it's going to sound like. There's And I think that's cool. Like there's so many different influences. And the other big thing, like Steve, you brought up Drake in The weekend. Like because Toronto has had... Um, 
you know, two artists from the city who have become internationally, like extremely successful, they've obviously inspired and paved the way for other artists in the city, not only in an abstract sense, instead of like in terms of just inspiring people, but they've both, especially Drake, they've set up record labels in the city where they sign up and coming artists who then go on to like work with the same people as them, producers and stuff like that. So it kind of lends itself like they've created you know, like a kind of sound like for the city, right? But Montreal, like I find you just have so many more, like more like pop influences, more like rock or like indie influences. Um, it's it's just like, I never know what I'm, I'm going to get. And I think that's, uh, I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> like more creative freedom, maybe. Like, I, I I don't know. There's there's not like a blueprint that I guess like maybe people feel like they have to follow. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you say that because that, I don't know, me from someone who moved to Toronto to be here to, to do music, I came here because I wanted a vaster creative outlet. And I feel Montreal offers that, you know. Um, when I think of, for example, uh, the fact that there isn't a unified sound, industries will always try to get you to make one type of sound because it's easier to, I guess, to, to, to market in terms of, oh, well, he made a song like that. And the truth is, a lot of times the industry is not going to go for what's the most artistic and the most unique, right? They're going to go for the thing that's the most uh, marketable, most um, profitable. So I think what's beautiful about Montreal, and, and it's not to say that Toronto doesn't have that either, because, you know, I think of Dylan Ponders, I think of Lex Leosis, Via Mighty, these different artists, even myself, we don't fit that niche of Toronto artists, you know? And then I come to Montreal, you have people like Naya Ali, who, you know, I don't think she gets spoken of enough, but she gets a lot of publications. And it's like, what I love about Montreal is you'll find what you're looking for if you're looking for it. And you'll find something if you're not looking for it. And their dance, their, their house scene here is, is really dope. You know, um, in terms of artists, their, their folk music is really dope. When I think of us folk music in Toronto, I can only think of Mustafa, you know. Mm. And even that's a variation that's really beautiful as well. But I think the thing I, I believe Toronto artists or our city could, could learn from the musical aspect is it's okay to experiment. And, but a lot of times, I, like Adriel was saying, is like when you're from a certain community and there's a specific sound associated to it, typically you're going to make music that sounds like that because you either identify with it, you know that it's popular. And the truth is a lot of the, blogs and publications they like that it's a genre of music because it sounds similar to something that is already popular you know mm -hmm. um and so i what i've loved about being in montreal just working with producers and, and especially with engineers their approach is a lot different they'll encourage you to be like hey no try singing this note try this flow and and then obviously just having french speaking artists i think what's really unappreciated about that is how it translates to european countries like if you can, ha if you're a French speaking artist, uh, predominantly a French speaking artist, and you can make music that will translate to France, that opens a bigger door to be able to make music that will go to Germany or Switzerland and all these different places where there, there is a lot of bilingual people there, you know? And, you know, you think of people like Booba or, or stuff like that, these big international artists that can come to Montreal and they like sell out the scene crazy. So I think... I think the problem which I like to address is I think for so long we've been trying to be on this benchmark of who's better rather than how can we complement each other because I think if Montreal and Toronto had more of those collaborations that um, established artists together then the musical infrastructure in Canada would be a lot different than what it is now you know it, it, you wouldn't have artists that always just want to go to LA and pop in LA but they don't really have like a structural found base or, or a place to come back and be like, oh, this is my, like Drake blew up outside of Toronto. He didn't blow up in Toronto. You know, from working with Lil Wayne, Rick Ross, uh, DJ Khaled, he went around and worked in these different cities and got love out, outside of his city. So I think if the, the structure of music was different, I think he would have blew up a lot faster in Toronto. And the same thing with The weekend as well. Hey, you guys, um, ju just a, qu a quick question, if I can um, jump on it, on, on this one. Do you think, Patrick, Canada is big enough um, to uh, to have hip-hop artists or whatever, like, blow? Because, as you said, you know, Drake mm -hmm. and all these guys, they blew from the States, mostly, you mm -hmm. know? So, if it can do you think we can make it... Is it big enough, actually, to have a, a real scene here or... Mm -hmm. 
we'll have to go outside anyways at some point, you know. Honnêtement, sorry, and I'm saying in French because I don't want to discriminate, you know what I'm saying? I have to respect it. Je pense, honnêtement, que oui. And the biggest, the biggest reason to why is the examples that we were talking about before. You have artists like Drake who are, I'd like to believe Drake is a generational artist. You know, he's going to go down as a national treasure for music, especially in Canada. Um, I think of people like The Weeknd who, and I use them too, and I know there's a lot of different artists. I just use them too because, you know, they've had crazy international success. The reason why I think Canada can be big enough is because New York became big enough at some point. LA became big enough at some point. And a lot of the reasons are because of the pioneers who were from there. Like you don't have LA's music scene if you don't have NWA. You don't have LA's music scene if you don't have Cool and, uh, cool and Dre, guys that are from Oakland. And those are all West Coast individuals. You don't have New York's music scene if you don't have Mob Deep, if you don't have Jay-Z, you don't have Big L, you don't have uh, Mace, all these different people that are from there. And I think there's like this fear of missing out that we have here in Canada where the the comparison the comparison complex takes away from what we can do like I, i don't know if some of you have noticed sometimes you look at an artist's bio it won't even say like canadian um songwriter or artist it'll just say songwriter rapper and all these different things because i guess they believe there's a stigma to either oh i'm going to be compared to drake or the weekend or if i say i'm canadian they might not think that my market's big enough but if you look at it montreal has some of the like most festivals in Canada. And a lot of the acts that come out here are American acts, international acts. So the platforms there, I think what, what happens is it's the financial structure under it, the execs that are in these places. Like it, we're fortunate enough to have someone like you, right, Steve? Like you identify with the people that are on your label. You identify with the music because you have an actual passion for the art itself. So you understand the language that's being transferred to you. So you're not just looking at is how can we make money? You want good music to be at the forefront and then engage in how we can profit from that. Whereas a lot of industries here in Canada are derived from, like you think of Universal Music Canada, that's just a beachhead from Universal that's in the States. You think of E1, that's an entertainment company from the States that just came here. So it's like, it's like we don't trust our own estate to build something. We kind of start off, we start off, and then we look at the Lego blocks on the side and we're like, ah, okay, like we need to sign, we need to sign more American acts, and then we'll be able to have that leverage. So for me, I do believe that Canada has it. And even if it just starts with with Montreal and Toronto, there's a pretty great place to start. You got three artists that won Grammys. Like I, I mean, how many people from different cities in the states or states in America have Grammys? You know what I mean? And The perfect example was talking about Kitronada. Like he literally brought back house music on the scene. And that's a guy from Canada. You know, so for me, I think if we if we don't do a good job as as whether it's like structures of music or uh, artists, producers, record execs, to really harbor what we have. And that's why I commend you a lot. Because I I didn't even I, I heard of Alakan on someone I was in Toronto. And I listened to him and I fell in love because I saw that, uh, this, this one video and I was like, yo, you know, right? And, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So for me, c'est, je, la manière que moi je le vois, c'est, do I, I want to be part of something that's going to build. And it is fun to be part of something that's already built. You know, it's cool to move into a house that's already been there, but you find a, a better sense of longevity when you're able to build something for yourself and, and see how the ground came up from the beginning to the end. So I think once, whether it's the bigger artists or the infrastructures themselves, identify that there's true talent in our country and we want to do something to, to harbor those people and put those guys at the forefront to kind of have a bigger national uh, sound for ourselves. I think that's when we'll be able to, to have wider conversations about it. But I'm very hopeful. I think, I do think it's big enough. That kind of leads right into my next question, um, which was how well do you think each city supports their up and, com- uh, up and coming artists and how can they do better? Adriel or Steve? Um, well, I, I want to say, I think that Toronto does a good job of supporting its artists in two different ways. There is like, I think in terms of like streaming and numbers and popularity, the street rap, really kind of runs a lot of Toronto in that sense. Some of the biggest artists are from that street rap 
uh, side. But I think the other side that's, you know, definitely not street rap, people who are not claiming that at all, get a lot of love from community stations like CJRU, from things like Manifesto, other festivals that put those people on. So I think there is support from them. I, I also think that what Patrick and Steve said about the infrastructure being built here, I think that it's it's uh, possible, but it's sometimes like the artists don't want that. The last artist I can remember from Toronto having that, you know, buzz in that same way was Party Next Door. Um, if anyone remembers Party Next Door, his first album was like played like, <laughs> yeah, it was played everywhere. There was parties where that would be played front to back, you know, there's like 40 and minutes. I still listen to that album. <laughs> yeah, 40 minutes, just him, you know, like, and, and, and the whole team was Toronto people. Like his videographer was someone I went to high school with. His producers were people from Brampton. And it was a whole thing about this is Toronto. This is us. This is a team. And I think that pride comes a lot from the media in Toronto for us to be like, okay, I feel proud to put on Patrick because he's from Toronto. I feel proud to have Hawaii Mighty on my show because she's from Toronto. I think that sometimes it feels like, at least from what I've seen, that the media, we have more pride in that than some of the artists. And they feel like they're maybe slighted because they're not getting the look down south or they're not getting the look out west. And I think that Montreal and Toronto are, are both big enough cities where if you have your city unlocked, that's, that, you know, can almost be good enough to take you to that next level. And I feel like sometimes it doesn't always feel like that. I feel, though, um, sometimes, it, 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 like, if I think of Keitronada, I mean... We knew that we knew Kaitronada because he was in the circle. He was, uh, but it took him to almost win a Grammy for him to get the mm -hmm. recognition he needed, like in Montreal. And and that's that that's kind of that's kind of bad. I mean, because right now that that's what's happening. I mean, you have those really dope artists that that if they don't if they don't pop like outside of Montreal, but people won't even recognize. So. Mm -hmm. This is something that that that's gonna have to to change at some point, but uh, because you have like you name some some of those dope artists, anglophone artists from Montreal. There are some dope artists. I work with uh, Zach Zoya. I work. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you talk. You talk about Nate Husser. I mean, Chris. Uh, I mean, there's there's was you. There's there's uh, plenty yeah, of yeah. dope artists that you know they did we have a hard time right now connecting with the audience because mm. I mean, there everybody recognize a talent, but I feel like we need to, to blow outside of, of Montreal or even Canada to get mm. that recognition. And this is something that we need to work on. That's for sure. In Montreal, especially. Would it, if I can ask you a question, because you make so many good points, what would be the, the most difficult thing you found with, for example, some of your artists, trying to get them like that connectivity with with montreal you mean well like like on my part my, like most 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 of my artists are are french so i mean mm -hmm. I, I work with two anglophone artists so mm -hmm. on the french side i mean it's easy because i know the market and and mm -hmm. and you can go outside of montreal you know like in the in in the, in the suburbs the region well, Right, right, right. And 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 you can like you have all this you can do about 50, 60 shows just you know mm. in Quebec itself. So we can grow like the audience and and, and we can uh, do a good living out of it. But on the Montreal scene, you know, it's mm. once you get out of Montreal, um, it's it's a bit harder. You know, it's a, it's a bit harder to connect with the audience. So. Mm. So yeah, I mean now, and I feel like there are some artists that can connect with the the French audience, and I'm I'm thinking yeah. about maybe like Mike Shab uh, is a good oh, idea. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Because Mike yeah. Shab is a francophone. I mean, uh, first language is 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 French, so mm. he kind of you know uh, he he hangs around with the with, with the French rappers, so. Mm -hmm. He's got a bit of this audience, but when when you're like strictly a, a anglophone rapper, yeah. it's hard to connect to connect with the audience right now. And that's what yeah. I feel. And I don't know if some other people can react on that, but that, yeah. that, that that's that's what I feel and, and see actually. Yeah. So how financially viable would you say it is to be an artist in each city? Or do you have to um, do you have to leave? Do you have to go to New York or or LA? 
I, <laughs> that's a tough I'm question. having discussions all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you better well, okay, talk about even, this too. Not necessarily. I'm not saying, okay, you want to be the next Drake. Okay, maybe. No, 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 no. You, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your question, no, your question is perfect. I think that's a topic of discussion a lot of artists and a lot of people have. But, but even just being able out. to make like a, a regular living, like I'm not saying, saying being a multimillionaire, yeah. like even just being able to make like a decent yeah. living, like how yeah. financially viable is it in, in each place? I, I would say it is, but from I, I do a lot of work in broadcast and stage mm-hmm. managing and stuff with venues. I think you have to be like a fairly like established big artist to do that, mm-hmm. um, just to make a living. I think there's artists who are like they may be verified, they may have some notoriety, but on a bill, they're not going to be the top two people. It doesn't really yeah, translate you know? financially. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think it's like if you are someone who's getting you know Juno nominated or you have like that kind of credibility where you'll be one of the top two headliners basically any show you do that's a smaller venue then you can definitely make a living but if you're consistently on the fourth line I would say mm-hmm. then it's probably um going to be tough and you probably have to have outside um ways of earning money whether it's you know having your songs being synced or you know doing other work outside of your actual um music but I think it's I think it's possible but I I would say that um it's a definitely a level of your music being at a certain level and like your actual like spotify listeners your actual people coming out i think there's plenty of people who are of like a lot of huge following but um can't book you know certain shows yeah and I, sure. and I, and I, yeah i would say that you yeah i would say for shows at least you got to be at a like a not yeah not all not all-star level but if this was basketball let's say like starter level you know you can start in the game and not come off the bench <laughs> I think as a six man, you can make a you can make a decent living. I mean, I don't know for for me, I've been fortunate enough, like you know, I've I've done collaborations with like companies. Like I know that for me, the turning point was like the TikTok collaboration. I was really huge for me and uh, and my team, and I was able to you know put some money aside for myself and my team, and then you know having the opportunities to do sync placements where I got paid for that. But I think a lot of it is um, it's weird because. It, Typically, people always say that it's more business than the music, but I, I also feel that if there isn't music to sustain whatever the business is, it doesn't work, you know? Um, the one biggest gripe that I have, I think, is kind of what Adrian was talking about. When you see artists that have a lot of streams or, like, a lot of monthly listeners, but it doesn't translate to shows where you actually make money. Because streaming, and I'm sure all of us know this, like, they don't really, it doesn't really pay like that, like that, you know? And typically... If you're assigned to a major record label, you're not even seeing the real percentage of where you're supposed to get, you know? That's why, for me as an independent artist, you start off being worried about, okay, I got to put my own money here, I got to put my... But the return is 100%, you know? And I think it's, 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 it's doable if you actually see the value of it, if you have a plan, if you have an, like, a vision board on what you think that looks like. If... Having an apartment downtown Toronto off shows and selling merch and all these different things is your goal, then yeah, then you're set. You know, like I was able to buy a house with like rap money. So for me, That's when good, I look though. at right, and when I look at my peers, I'm like, okay, like, yeah, some of you guys go to LA, you guys go to New York, but you don't really have anything to call your own. Like when I'm done music, I I can flip this crib and still have more money than what I did when I got out, and I'm still gonna get paid from everything I already put out, you know? And I, so I think it, it does, it's really based on what you actually have as a vision, you know? Um, and so I think it is doable. The expectations have to be real and the work ethic has to match that expectation as well, which includes like meeting people. Like as a side note, like it's such an honor to meet you, Steve. I've heard so much about you. I've been following the label for so long since I got to Montreal and to actually get to see you in real life is is a cool feeling, you know. And I just bumped into Zach before getting here. Uh, he was doing it. He's getting ready to do an E Talk Daily interview for for his rollout from his, his EP. So I'm like, it's cool, you know. But I don't know if people understand that even that's part of that process, like the connectivity of of meeting someone, asking questions, being open to asking questions. So. I think it's, I, I still think it's very possible. I just think the expectations have to be realistic. Exactly. So Steve's thoughts on like the French scene and something I'm also uh, like French scene in Montreal, but I'm also thinking, do you specifically target like other French speaking parts of the world, like France yep. or, or like? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Um, but 
like I said, some of our artists that are like big in, in Quebec, and I have to say Quebec because you were you were asking if it, it was uh, it was uh, it could be uh, good uh, financially uh, here for a uh, French um, rapping artist that you know that that has success. I'm thinking about. Fouki or Corias or Alatlar Ensemble or um, or Soja, these guys, I mean, I can tell you they 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 do a good they have a, they do a good living that, that's for sure, but like I said, they have they have the streams and they have the audience that go that that, that goes to the show so mm -hmm. so um, we can do well and when we go like outside we go in France and what well it's you have to accept that okay it's it's kind of like a restart you know because mm -hmm. you need to go get the audience over there so the ones that we don't have so i mean the um, my money is not so good but you have to see it like uh okay this is like another uh another place that i want to explore and and, and get some more fans you know but mm -hmm. i mean I have to say it. I mean, the, the core of the, the, the money and the, the fans and all that. I mean, it's Quebec. It, it's, uh, it's Quebec city. It's uh, Montreal. It's, it's gets, no, it's, it's all the suburbs. That, but like I said, when you do like, like 50, 60 shows, uh, a year, I mean, That's you can do crazy. well. That's yeah. Tour. You can do well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and there's plenty of festivals. We just did like Francophonie. Mm -hmm. um like uh, friday we opened the francophonie we had the biggest stage with Corias. i mean that's about thirty thousand people in the street just you know to uh to see you perform and the the, the night after we had soldier at, at the same stage the, the the main stage so this is where we are right now on on you know uh speaking of hip-hop in montreal but we're there on the francophone side so um and i can't wait that we we can we could be at, at the same level on uh, on the anglophone side with art with local artists because there will be some like big rappers that will do the main stages at on the the the, the jazz fest uh, let's say but they won't be from montreal that that's that's the thing for now so I have a couple um, specific questions for each of the panelists. Uh, first of all, Adriel, this, <laughs> this was something I didn't even think of, but when I had my call with you, you brought this up to me and I, and I was like, well, that's a good point. Um, how aware uh, are Toronto artists and industry professionals of the hip hop scene in Quebec? Mm. Very little. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but um, <laughs> very little. Um, actually, the, probably the same day I met Patrick, but I had Nate on my, on my show like three, four years ago, one of the first episodes. And he was telling his, his story about how he grew up and how that inspired his music. And basically everyone in the studio was just dumbfounded that someone in Montreal could live a life like that. And I was like, what do you guys think happens in Montreal? And I always, I always think about that now is like, it's, it's what people think of Montreal who live in Toronto is always so like just wild to me. And I think that's a huge part of it is they don't look at it as like similar, super different. They just think of it as like, who knows what they're doing over there. Mm. And I think, I think that is something that it's, I think it's a Toronto complex. If I want to be like, you know, fair, like in Toronto, we do think we're the center of the universe to some degree. And everyone, yeah. everyone thinks that their block is the hardest block and their hood is the hardest hood. Mm. And so I think that in that sense, there is a bit of, you know, really kind of discrediting what, what goes on in Montreal from a hip hop standpoint. And then as well, like the talent, I think that Montreal is so known for folk, indie, pop, and then house and application out of that. To hear someone from Montreal who raps well, is just like almost like mind blowing. It's like everyone in Canada who raps good must come from Toronto. There's mm -hmm. no way anyone outside of Toronto raps well. So I, I think that those two things are, are a huge part of it. And because Toronto artists think we are the center of the universe, that it's it's almost this they don't they don't even consider Montreal competition don't even think of them so it's more like a subconscious thing you know I, I couldn't see a Toronto rapper taking shots at Montreal it's because Montreal probably wouldn't even be on their radar to take shots at you know they would take shots at Chicago or Atlanta before they take shots at Montreal and so I think that you know people like again Patrick Nate Chris 
Like those are the are the guys who are kind of changing that idea of what people think of Montreal hip hop, because I think that they just they're they're it's like kind of what Drake did. I would say I think now people think of Drake as a consensual Canadian, and he represents so much people think of Canada. But before Drake was the Canadian, there was Shad, there was Cardinal, there was Shaw Claire, mm-hmm. and all of those guys people didn't consider them the Canadian look or what's Canadian enough. It was almost like oh Cardinal's more Caribbean than Canadian. You know, Shaq Claire is more American than Canadian, even though he's Canadian. So I think now it's kind of the switch of you see someone from Montreal, hear someone from Montreal, and you're like, they're not Canadian. They're from Montreal. This is what Montreal looks like. Montreal sounds like Montreal lives like. My uh, my second question for you, Adriel, uh, do you have any unique perspectives or experiences that you can share as a radio host in uh, in hip hop in Toronto? I, I, would, I would say uh, two things. Um, one, I would say that a lot of hip hop artists in Toronto are pretending to be single. I know that's not at all what you, what you thought was going to happen, but, um, uh, <laughs> yes, Patrick laughing. That's yeah. A, a lot, a lot of times when I interview someone, they'll show up with their girlfriend of 40 years <laughs> and it's like, this is nowhere in your music. I would have never guessed this. So I would say that that is one, um, and then, and then too, like a lot of like a lot of people who are especially coming up, like people have like day jobs or other jobs, and which I, that's like part of you know the story, part of you you know getting getting where you're gonna get. But I remember when I interviewed Fi and Mighty, it was the same week she quit her job at Long and McQuaid, and and she was so excited that that was like you know I worked there for three four years, and basically the week of the album I don't have to work there anymore, and that was so rare for me to hear like an artist be so open with that about like. I finally get to do music full time and not have this other job. And so I think that's, that's kind of the, the other thing that I see a lot of artists are not as open to saying like, yeah, I still work at Burger King four shifts a week, but I make this rap music as well. It's kind of like trying to just show the rap music mm-hmm. and not show what else is going on because that's part of the story. Some of our films, our favorite artists we've known about their come up, whether like Drake dropping out of high school or J Cole struggling to finish college. You know that whatever you did coming up is part of your story, and I feel like that's something that people really hide here in Toronto. So would you Take say it you make it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Would you say maybe I think I, I think I would agree with this. Um, would you say Toronto artists maybe like front more? Be careful. Listen, listen, careful. listen, careful. listen. We're in some scary careful. territory. Be um, be careful, fam. Listen. There, 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 is, there is some fake in the funk. I'm not going to lie about that. There is some fake in the funk. But, um, you know, I, I feel like that's almost part of Toronto in a sense. As sad as that is to say, like, that almost is um, part of Toronto. Even when it comes to the street rap, the dude who might be doing the street rapping may not be the most street dude. He may just be from the block where that happens. And so it's almost, it's almost as if that's, like, understood. I would say most times in Toronto, unless you hear about someone beforehand, because Toronto, everyone knows everyone, like um, with eight, with 88 Camino and Derek Wise, like those guys were kind of known before they were a group for what they did on their own and the lives they lived outside of hip hop. So whenever they were talking about it, it became even more of a lore because people knew about them. But unless you're one of those artists and people are just hearing about you the first time with your raps, it's almost assumed that it's mostly fibs. Hmm. Yeah, I want to clarify. I wasn't suggesting that that's a particularly Toronto thing. I mean, I think it's safe to say that's kind of a rap like thing in general. Yeah, so just, very rap general. Yeah. Just clarifying. Um, so now I have a couple uh, specific questions for Steve. Um, what is the relation? This is something I'm really curious about. What is the relationship between the English and French hip hop scenes in Quebec? Are they like very separate from each other? Are they like do they intermingle a lot? Like, what is their relationship to each other? Uh, they tend to start working together, but um, what I I can see is like people mostly try to, um, especially if you're an Anglophone artist and uh, you're trying to do it your way. Sometimes you just don't want to mix with the francophone scene and the mm. the Quebec system. I, I could say because, like I said, you know, you have all. Yeah, you have this this Quebec star system that is very francophone, and sometimes you don't want to be in that mix because it, it, it's it's kind of saying that like you address your music to to this audience, and this is 
maybe not the goal actually you know but we uh we saw some some nice collaboration i'm thinking of fuki and nate Oster that we did uh we released a single last year we did a video and it was it was it was cool it was a montreal thing it was like you know to uh pop and artists from montreal and it, so yeah there there are some um there are th some things that are getting done but i i say i have to say and and patrick maybe you will agree but um most scene are kind of separate we we don't yeah exactly like the shows you can see like on the same bill you'll see uh, a lot of francophone artists you know but you don't see that often like uh anglophone and and, mm -hmm. and francophone and just to, to let you know we had this uh, metro metro festival uh two weeks ago two or three weeks ago and And it was like the second edition. It was it was nice. I mean, we had major acts that, that came out here, and uh, and Olivier, the like the, the founder of the festival, he he wanted to mix mix it up a bit, you know, and have like uh, Loud, which is one of the biggest rapper here uh, in Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Carias and Fouki on on you know, and he tried to mix it on on, on the like the, the the festival, but it don't mix that well. I gotta say because mm -hmm. um, like it, the audience uh, they won't come from for 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 these uh, francophone acts. I mean, I mean if you have 90% of your uh, of your bill that's anglophone um and 10% french well maybe only 10% of your audience want to to hear some francophone rap you know mm -hmm. so what i would suggest and that's what i already told Olivier i think he should if it's like a three days fest festival maybe he should do like mm -hmm. two days in in English and one francophone mm -hmm. day where we can mix uh, rap keb and also like Frank uh, French rap from from France. Uh, I think that would translate better with mm. uh, with the audience. That's tough. Mm, yeah, that's actually tough. Uh, Steve, would you say what like are there unique? Um, there must be, but what unique um, advantages or challenges uh, do francophone rap artists face? I mean, I think you've already touched on this, but anything else uh, in particular? Well, uh, of course, like like I said, we have this uh, we have this this system here that we can do a, a living with just French music because we have our own medias. We have like francophone uh, channels on tv and we have you know uh francophone medias and all that that that, that will certainly help us that's the, the the biggest advantage i mean mm -hmm. i am seeing this this generation right now of of uh hip-hop from quebec uh, francophone uh we, we we we're starting to see like the first millionaires of rap in quebec um in french music this is pretty big i mean uh and and i've been in this business for 20 years and even 10 years ago you didn't you couldn't see that but now mm -hmm. you know with uh with the shows because we're we're the the um, we're the most streamed uh we're the genre that's most the, the most streamed uh, right now in quebec also also all the labels uh, from montreal They want the rappers now. They want the, the French rappers, and, and <laughs> they want because they, they see us succeed. And and I'm I'm fortunate enough to have uh, a couple of the biggest acts on my label. But I've been doing this for 20 years, and people thought I was crazy when I started my label. You know, because uh, it's a rap. Rap was not the, the thing, but now rap is is the is the biggest uh, genre in the world. So. <sighs> So yeah, man, we um, it's we're we're living it now, and um, and and like I said, hopefully, like uh, the anglophones will will uh, will eat properly also with the mm -hmm. with with the rap here because uh, that we we need to to get this thing going. Mm -hmm. Damn, I definitely did not think that there were like French rappers who were millionaires. <laughs> really surprising to me. <laughs> So I, I won't I won't name you everybody. No, 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 no. that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really wouldn't have thought. So don't underestimate Montreal. I mean, <laughs> um, so Patrick, specifically as a, as an artist, um, how has going kind of going back and forth uh, between Montreal and Toronto? 
how has each city like inspired or uh, influenced you as an artist? Um, Montreal made me a better singer. Um, I learned I learned a lot that there's a niche and a fit that that appreciates that. Uh, I, I would want to say pure melodies, um, less trying to dive too much in auto tune and stuff like that. But then you kind of have that as well here. Um, I appreciate the sound engineers here, like getting to work with them and actually sitting in a studio and just getting the opportunity to uh, he see how people operate differently. Um, I think also wanting to want getting the chance to try to connect with French artists to, to try to get like collaborations. And, and for me, it doesn't even just have to be doing a feature and get them to do a verse or things like that. But, you know, sometimes I speak French in my music. I'll have, I'll have these little gems in there because I think, you know, as a Congolese individual, it's important for me to speak French being born in Montreal. It's important for me to speak French. And so I always want to have, for example, like I'll ask a friend, like, Hey, can you say this line in here? just so it adds like an ad lib or all these different things. So I think being in Montreal has given me the ability to create more at a, at a higher pace than I used to in Toronto. But what I love the most about Toronto is, you know, like where I'm from, you know, I'm from downtown Toronto. My block is like Red Espadina and Queen. And the story that comes with that, I, I can never shake that off. And I think it gives me a, a, a validity and an authenticity to my music as well, because, you know, like Adrian was saying, like I'm someone – you know, my neighborhood has these things with all these other neighborhoods. I have friends that are from different areas. And I've, I was never the, the street dude. I was just a guy that was friends with a lot of the street dudes. So, you know, I've had unfortunate experiences, great experiences. And I get to tell that story, almost like Kendrick's um, Good Kid, Mad City. Like a lot of times my stories are driven from that perspective. And then just a team of individuals I met there, like it's giving me this business savvy interpretation of how I need to protect my music, protect my independence as an artist. And rather than look to get signed, looking more for collaboration. So I think this business and, and community of what I took from Toronto and the create the creativity that I have from Montreal has really helped me blend and like have my own sound and, and identify myself more as an artist. So would you say you've had like the same amount of success, like making connections in the industry and collaborating with people in both cities? That's a good question. I've never really thought of that. I think in terms of in terms of success, I think I, I always feel like I get a lot more love in Toronto than I get in Montreal, mm -hmm. um, which which is completely understandable because not to say like I'm not one of them. And I mean, more in a sense, like I didn't grow in the infrastructure of music in Montreal. So like when the posters came out, I wasn't here. Um, when all these different individuals were, were building up, I wasn't here. You know, I kind of got here when all these guys started establishing themselves. Um, I always get a lot more love in Toronto. And, you know, shout out to Adriel. He's one of the people that, that really kind of trailblazed the way for people to kind of show me love in Toronto. Um, but I think what I love about Montreal is Montreal, especially when I have shows out here, I got a lot of love from people out here. Uh, and I think people just love coming to shows. DJs show me a lot of love here. Um, but in terms of relationships, I think I had better, maybe I think I have better artist relationships in Toronto. And now I'm starting to build better exec relationships in Toronto. But mm -hmm. at the same time in Toronto, I already kind of built connections with like individual, like, like being able to work with Coalition who had ties to Warner. Um, one of my good friends works at Warner. So I don't know. I think that one, I don't really have a, uh, a stat to kind of show. I think only time will tell. But my goal is to definitely collaborate with more people here and and be able to, to kind of foster those relationships. And again, it doesn't even have to be musically. I think just more like putting events together, uh, like putting experiences together. I think that's an aspect that I think a lot of us, especially as artists, forget. I think a lot of people are always on this. I'll give you something. You give me something back. And I'm not really like that. Like, I just want to see what can come of an experience. Hmm. So I know it's coming up to three o'clock. I'm not sure. Do we have to stop at three or can we go to 3.30? Um, fourth space people or? I'm, 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 personally, I'm good for another 30 minutes. I got, oh, I, I know that we all are. I'm just saying like. <laughs> we can go for another 30 minutes. Okay, perfect. It's till 3.30. Okay, perfect. Um. So then another question I have for you, uh, Patrick, well, I have in here, um, 
how do I, how do I ask this? Um, I was going to ask, cause my original idea was to have like one artist, like a Toronto artist and then a, and then a Montreal yeah. artist and kind of like ask the Toronto artists, like, do they feel like they face more competition because they're based out of a, mm. a city where there's just a bigger like rap scene. And then mm. in Montreal, is it like, you know, if you think pros and cons, like maybe there isn't so much of a scene in Montreal, but there's less competition. Um, mm. Like, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Cause I feel like, um, even like when I have artists like, like from Montreal, uh, you know, reach out to me and send me their music. I mean, the vast majority of time it's like, great. And it's, you know, I, I put it on air. Like there's just not a ton of like competition, at least I, I guess maybe a lot, not a lot of people focus on radio or know me or, or, uh, whatever, but is there like, uh, yeah. Do you have thoughts on that on like competition, like comparing each city? I definitely think in Toronto there's competition. Um, because it starts off with like how Adrian and I were describing the community first. Like some people will show a lot more love to, to like for example, uh, specific communities, and it always ends up being like the street art, the street artist. As and it's such a, I always have a very strange relationship with that aspect of it, just because I find street music, like I'm a very self conscious individual. Like I, I, I like to believe I'm pretty emotionally intelligent, and I think that music kind of propels the politics to keep like pushing in Toronto. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know about the city of Toronto when it comes to music. The reason why this music is so popular is because it's charged by these things that are happening behind the scenes, you know, and it's detrimental to our communities. And even if the music is good, it's going to be put there. So as an artist, I have to compete with, I have to compete with the narrative first. And then you have, so you have the narrative of like that street music, the stories that are being told, oh, who's, who's beefing with this? Who's this and that? Who's this and that? And unfortunately, you know, that's also music that's popular because it sounds, or there's a similar sonic um, relatability to what's popping in the States, right? Like you think of drill music, um, you think of uh, ATL rappers, like Lil Baby, Gunna, all those different things. These like melodic, like I was saying, melodic, melancholic type of tracks. Um, but in Montreal, there is a scene there. I think I can't say that there isn't a scene here. There's multiple scenes here. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. In Toronto, I, in Toronto, I feel like there's like two scenes. There's the street artists and there's the non-street artists. And in those non-street artists, I include the R&B singers, mm -hmm. whether female or male. In Montreal, you'll have the house, the house singer. Oh, sorry. And I think the DJs now in Toronto are starting to build a scene for themselves as well. So like shout out to Caruza, those the, like that whole group of individuals that's putting stuff together. But in Montreal, you have like the pure source hip hop, you have um, the the folk music like that, that electric pop, you have the house scene, the Afro house scene, um, the kind of pop R&B scenes. There's a lot of scenes here. Um, so I don't know if I, I wouldn't call it competition here. I think it's more so just connectivity, right? So if you see, if someone, someone sees me as an artist, like I'll talk, I'll speak French. Oh, French speaking, but then you go check my music, it's all English. So I personally don't know how the audience connects to those realities. I don't know if they're preferring to choose one over the other. Um, mm -hmm. But I think with me a lot, like I've been fortunate enough for people love my music also because they, they appreciate me as a person, like they F with me as a person first. And I think a lot of times that happens from when I perform, you know, I'm a very interactive performer and I like to believe I'm a very strong performer. And I take the chance to do that. So I think in Toronto, I definitely have that competition in terms of the narrative and the sound, um, trying to break that barrier of, hey, guys, like, I'm not the only person that doesn't sound like a street artist. Like, we're a group over here. You guys should come check this out. But then in Montreal, because there's so much of those different um, niches, and, I, and, and Steve could also kind of give his perspective on that, because there's all these different niches and you have the division of the language, it's kind of like there's so much to pick from. How do you know what's going to be good? unless someone is bringing it to you. So I don't think I face competition here. I think here my, the, the, not the issue, the challenge would be more connectivity, but in Toronto, yeah, there's definitely like that competition. So I'm happy that I get a lot of love in Toronto because I understand how hard it is to kind of get that following. Hmm. So speaking of like the division in, in uh, languages, Steve, is it kind of like, will only French speaking people listen to French rap? Like, are you kind of, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's just that, you know, it's, I don't think it's like in uh, the habits to listen to local uh, anglophone rap because mm. I mean, most uh, I'd say the, the audience uh, that's used to listen to uh, 
Frank Francophone rap. They, I mean, they're really into it. That that's what they listen to. And uh, if they want to listen to Anglophone rap, well, they listen to what's what they what they know and what what's easy to get on 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 the DSPs and all that. So it's mostly like like you said, the little babies and and you know, I don't think um, the the French audience is so curious to uh to discover like the, the the local anglophone rappers because they got they got what they what what they search for on the on the french scene well that's pretty much what i think unless like i said it it, it blows uh it blows like internationally and then and then you want to be a part of it so uh, so yeah that's what i think so what do you think each city um, could do to better support like local artists and, uh, and independent artists? I think we should collaborate uh, more. That's for sure. Um, and, and it's funny because I was at, at uh, Metro Metro and, and, you know, I was talking about, I was just saying, you know, I work on management with Zach, Zach Zoya and people, they don't know uh, they don't know him but we have a, a hit single right now which mm -hmm. which is called start over and it's it's popping like in canada all over and and people don't know the name but then i play him the song and they're like oh yeah i know this guy i know i know the song mm -hmm. and then that and then uh i was talking to some people in toronto some rappers that were there and, and they're like uh yeah we should we should collaborate and i don't i don't think like Uh, I think people want to collaborate, but I, I just, like Patrick said, I, I'm not sure people know that there is a scene that is starting to, to bubble in Montreal. That's a good point. I don't see, not only do I not see a lot of collaborations between like Toronto artists and Montreal artists, but even in like, or even in the Quebec scene, I don't see a lot of uh, like collaborations or features between like English and French speaking um, artists. I don't, I don't see that very often. No, no, not that much. There, there are a couple, but, but I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not something we see really often. No. So speaking of um, like supporting local artists, independent up and coming artists, Adriel, uh, what do you think is like the main, um, sort of like role of, uh, of community radio in that, especially in Toronto? I think it's giving the artists that spotlight that they wouldn't get otherwise, especially when it comes to hip hop, the non-street artists. Um, there's definitely been a change over like the past three years of non-street artists getting more of a, of a shine, but you know, street artists were getting like the bulk of the love for a very long time. And I kind of took it upon myself to be like, listen, you don't got to sell drugs to be on my show. So, I think that that's kind of the, the goal of community radio. And then the different ways that community radio chooses to promote artists. I know that at least um, commercial radio for a long time in Toronto, weren't doing a lot of interviews with artists, weren't doing like things in person. And it was just more focused on we're trying to play the hits and that's how we're going to get the ad money and get people in. And with community radio, we have all these different integrations and in ways that we you know, support the community, support artists and put artists on and using those opportunities to have local artists, you know, Ryerson, I know it's TMU now, but Ryerson used to have, you know, huge artists every year, whether it was Future or Nas or French Montana. And it was like a point made that every year it would be two or three local artists opening up for them and trying mm -hmm. to get one from Ryerson. So things like that is like something that the community stations do and can do that maybe commercial stations are not um, focused on. And I, and I think as well that like there's in Toronto there's kind of thing where there's so, like there's so many people involved in the industry in some way like Patrick knows this in Toronto like you can meet someone and think you just met someone who's not involved in the industry at all and then you mm -hmm. add them on Instagram and they're a photographer or you mm -hmm. add them on Instagram and they're an engineer and it's almost like everyone you know is involved in the industry where you have to kind of get your music out to people who are not in the industry who are, who are, who are seeing your music in an actual real organic way And I would say that's kind of the role of community radio where someone is like, I just like the radio. I just like music. I'm just here to hear what you're doing for the community. And that's, those are the people who you want to make your fans because in Toronto, like almost everyone you meet is going to be tied to the industry in some way. And it's hard to find those people who are not. So that's kind of the audience you're looking for. And I think the community radio like infrastructure we have does a good job of finding those people. 
So I'll be honest, I've asked all my big, like we've all touched, we've touched on the big questions that I had for you all, but I know that there must be things that have come to your mind through this conversation or anything else uh, that anyone wants to bring up. Go ahead. This is your chance. I actually wanted to talk about like, um, I think, I think a lot of, a lot of us forget, well, actually, sorry, not forget, but what doesn't get talked about enough on how to sustain, I guess, a career or what's very helpful is like grants. Hmm like how that has like been a huge service to a lot of artists. Um, I think, like I know I've discussed with some of the peers, like a lot of record labels tend to get the grants because, you know, obviously they have the the the, the labor and the, the personnel to do it. So I guess sometimes independent artists, they feel a little bit slighted by that um, to not be able to get in that. And I wanted to see what Adriel and Steve or even yourself, Megan, what you guys thought about, about that, like should, should independent artists have more access to those funds instead of like re- like signed acts to major labels um, or should it kind of just be a free for all like it is now? Cause one's always going to have an advantage over the other. Hmm. Um, but what I can say is there, there are, I mean, I'll, I'll talk for, uh, for, for Quebec because this is pretty mm-hmm. much what I know, but uh, there are like, grants for for independent artists you know uh what i what i kind of what i uh, i tend to see is that artists sometimes they just don't know how to go get get the grants Mm -hmm. and um because there is for for calc uh sorry about that uh yeah there is for uh from calc which is the conseil des arts des lettres du quebec there is from uh, Council of Canada. There are, uh, I mean, so there are some different and music action, which is a factor, but the, the francophone side of, of factor. Mm-hmm. And there are some grants for the, the artists, but it's not so easy to go get them if you don't, if you don't have uh, already um, a certain fan base or, or some mm-hmm. stats because, and the, that's the thing right now. I mean, ten years ago there w- there were no stats, or or mm-hmm. and, and now everybody's looking at the stats. They look at the YouTube numbers. They look at the the the, the DSP numbers, and, and and so so yeah. Um, but there there are some grants, and um, well, for us, I mean, we're 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 kind of uh, past that because we're we're. Uh, a label that get like uh, annual envelopes, you know, that we mm-hmm. need to spend on different artists. So, mm-hmm. um, so we don't have this uh, this kind of problem at this point. But we we used to. Uh, I mean, I was an artist. I started as an artist uh, twenty years ago, mm-hmm. and I had to, uh, you know, I had to go get the grants, uh, and I had mm-hmm. to find them, find them, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't all, always easy. But uh, mm-hmm. but, but uh, at the same time. Um, grants are not for everyone. I mean, uh, if it's government mo- money and you're you're doing street raps and, and you do, uh, there, there are some some things that you say that you can't really ask for for public money also. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's another place where like community radio comes in because i I don't know a ton about uh grants personally but like i know radio play like helps a lot with getting um i'd imagine it helps a lot with getting grants but even getting added to like playlists on uh like spotify and um like apple music i've heard i know that 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 helps a lot and that's a good point steve like people are so obsessed with stats nowadays right like followers streaming numbers like radio play charts you know that's another like big part of my job so um yeah people are just like really uh really obsessed with that adriel i think it should be kind of go more towards independent artists i know like in my work i i work with grants a lot um uh, actually this the live show that me and patrick did it was a grant that got that together um mm. and i'm and i'm applying for grants for a program I'm working on later on in the year but i think that it's the a lot of artists don't know about them for sure i think that's like the biggest thing i've noticed is when I talk to artists about like, what are you working on coming up? Like, are you getting a grant for your new video? What's the budget for that? They don't even know that these things exist. And I think that these grants should be more an artistic merit. Um, if your video has like a concept that fits the song that you want to bring to you know fruition, you should get a grant for that no matter what your stats are. So I feel like that's the biggest thing is that they should be going to someone who has that artistic vision 
they know what they want to do they have that idea and then the awareness because i there's this there's so many artists who like they're using their they're putting their own money into things they're going to be doing things because they don't have the money or they may have are hiring people that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing because they don't know that these options um are there and then i thought about when you said the awareness i'm on the jury for the polaris prize and I can't even tell you how many artists I've talked to who don't even know what the player's prize is. And this is an award that gives you money, <laughs> you know, like for your album that only has to be six songs long and you get money even if you don't win. So to think of there's, there's, a, there's a Canadian award that you get, you know, only Canadians are involved. You put an album out, it doesn't have to be 10 songs and you get money even if you don't win and artists aren't aware of that is like, crazy to me so things like and again grants awards like the Polaris Prize are something that basically every independent artist should be aware of and I think that would give more artists confidence without the numbers because seeing like the Polaris Prize things like grants at least some of them can be based on your artistic merit so if you have this amazing idea this amazing concept album that you've got to record in your room but you want money for a video you know you should feel confident that my idea is good enough if I apply for this grant the right way I can get money for this video or if I put out this album, you know, as good as I think it is, it will reach the people to maybe get some notoriety with this award. Mm -hmm. So I think that those would be two ways that would give the independent artist who doesn't have the views or a manager yet or the infrastructure or, or money for a video, the confidence to say like, my music is still good enough regardless of where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I also want to stress, you know, like if grants, uh, if grants are not for you or whatever, like truly, it's never been a better time to be an independent artist, right? I mean, we all have access to social media, we can all make connections, network, like manage ourselves, um, you know, people are making albums from their bedrooms from a laptop, you don't even need real instruments, you don't need a huge studio, like you, you can do a ton on your own. I mean, I'm shocked, like when I talk to artists, I'll hear their albums and I'll talk to them and they tell me that they literally made it like in their bedroom on their laptop. And I'm like, how, you know, like this, it's just incredible stuff you can do with, with like production and engineering and stuff like that. So really, um, yeah, of course grants are there for you, but, but really like if you're willing to like learn and just like work at it, like you can do, you can do so much with like very little, you know, equipment, I guess. So is there anything, anything else on anyone's mind that they want to bring up? I'm just, uh, just, uh, just uh, actually, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, um, do you guys think there are enough radio, uh, radio specialized radios for, for, uh, for hip hop R and B in Canada? Because in Montreal, there's not that, that many actually. And, and that's that. That was kind of the question when I asked. Do you think Canada is big enough? Because you know, if you, if you go in the states, first population is a lot lot bigger but there are like like it, it's it's really in the culture you know there are radios uh, a lot of radio shows and and it's e easier to get into the cu culture I feel, I feel. I, I would definitely say I don't think like the radio presence in hip-hop really reflects like how big these genres are for sure I mean in Toronto there is like at least one like dedicated hip hop station thing is called flow or, or something like that. But I even check it out sometimes. And I look at the stuff that they play and I'm like, I, I don't know if this is completely representative of like, I don't know, Toronto sound or all the artists out there and what we have out there. And then, and then of course in Montreal, um, we don't have a, a, a station dedicated to hip hop. And that was a big reason why I started my show, because like I said, I grew up in Toronto. I grew up, you know, surrounded by, um, these music, this music, I mean, whether I like it or not, like my upbringing was punctuated by Drake albums or the weekend albums, you know, like, you know, I remember, like, I can think of like what, what year his albums came out based on, okay, I remember like I was in this grade or whatever, you know? So I, I grew up around that. And then I come to Montreal and I mentioned to people like, they're like, yeah, like what music do you listen to? And I say like hip hop and they look at me like I have three heads, like truly. And, you know, I asked them what they listen to and they say, you know, folk or like pop or indie. And I'm just kind of like, I need to start a, like a hip hop show at this station. And, um, you know, and there's so, uh, even at CJLO, I mean, that's a big part of, of my job is trying to find um, more uh, hosts who are willing to have shows and play this kind of music, um, expand our library, make more connections and stuff like that. But I think it's only a matter of time before a hip hop label gets started. It, or, sorry, a, uh, a hip hop station, record uh, radio station gets started in Montreal. I'm very interested to see 
who might be a part of that or um I mean, we, we, we've been talking to people to see what, what's going on there, but they, they say like the, the I don't know how, how you say in English, the, the, the waves or li liaison radio. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, help me here. Yeah, uh, the stations. They, yeah. they say that the, 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 um, they say the liaisons sont saturées uh, mm -hmm. because you so need the, the channels. Yeah, yeah. You know, you need some uh, the, the 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 channels, or they, they all say it's. Uh, I mean, there's no room for another radio. So that means that means that there would have to, to be like a station that completely like uh, switch what they're doing to dedicate their their station to uh, to hip hop music. You know, you think um, it has to be an existing station that would have to like pivot and then be yeah. Worried? Oh, that, wow. yeah because there's the the like i said i don't i don't i don't know the english uh, word but the, like there's no no other channel uh, available to uh, to have another radio that's what they say well after that you know but but I, i've always i've always said the first uh people that are going to commit on doing a hip hop radio in montreal mm -hmm. i mean yeah. it's going to go it's going to go man well, I'm looking at three people. Is this our next project? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Nobody's right because that's what happened to that's what happened to Flo. Like Flo ninety three point five got got revamped, decked out, gone, and now it's Vibe one hundred five FM. And Flo, like for a lot of people, they don't understand that Flo was the only because it wasn't just about the channel itself. It was about the representation, the the staff, the the history behind it. You know, it was pure hip hop, soca, R&B, reggae. Like it was cultural at its finest. And a lot of people don't know about, but like by statistic, Canada's most um, loved, most listened to genre is alternative rock. And that's literally cultural. Like that is part of Canadian's culture of music, you know? And so like Steve was saying, hip hop wasn't, is it, hip hop was very new to, to Canada. It wasn't really fully accepted by Canadians. In the States, yeah, because there's a lot of, social movements that were associated to hip hop. So it was easy to be easier to be in, integrated in their, their everyday lifestyle. You know, think of Public Enemy, again, NWA, um, all these different things, even like during the Black Panther movement or like a lot of the segregation movements and the Rodney King situations, there was always hip hop telling a story about these situations. We would have needed a native or an indigenous person to talk about Canadian issues through hip hop for it to probably be popular at the time. You know, there's a lot of stories that are hidden that are not being spoken of. So here, I think it's interesting that they say like, hey, for hip hop, we're going to have to get rid of another channel to let it come in. And it's like, if you think of in Montreal, which, which, which I think is very unfair to both the Francophone artists and the English, the Anglophone artists, because it becomes, okay, in Toronto, there's already that gripe of being able to have a channel for hip hop that can solely, um, or multiple ones that will solely put that up. But then those same channels are asked like, hey, can you kind of mix it up a bit? So you'll hear some Ariana Grande's on there all of a sudden and to kind of mix that audience, right? Because they have to be able to, to get a certain amount of plays and, and I guess like ears to their, to their channel. And by doing that, you're going to play popular songs. But then you come to Montreal, if, they, if they're telling people like, oh, no, on doit se débarrasser d'une chaîne pour être capable d'avoir une autre, I think it's really, it limits and it segregates the, those artists, right? Because then it's like, all we have is YouTube, DSPs. And most of these people, they have to settle for going on DistroKid or getting these distributions that don't really, un, like, they don't really deal with them as artists. You're kind of just like a fish in a pond. Like, okay, yeah, bring your stuff to the table. We'll put it out. And we'll send you an email to let you know it was released. Like you don't really have, if you don't have someone like Steve, you know, like or or some people from other other labels that can do that from distribution companies that could do that for you, you kind of don't really get the feeling of of being like identified as as an important artist um, outside of that metric. So I think it's really unfortunate that it's like that. Um, but like you said, the, the people that decide, okay, you know what, we're going to dedicate our time to try to have a channel for for hip hop and make it like a mix of Anglophone and, and Francophone, whether it's like even artists from France and stuff, those guys are going to be, they're going to get the cake because they're going to trailblaze a, a, a scenery for people. But then again, it's who's going to be the person to do it, you know, so. 
Let's give that cake, Patrick. One hundred percent. I like this because it's now you're like it's making me think. Like I don't know why I never thought about like reaching out to people that I know that do radio here. Like yo, dude, connect with like connect with these artists. Like try to get them on the radio. You know. So it's interesting. So I'm definitely gonna try to do my part. And you know, I bought a house here, so might as well get with the program. <laughs> I mean, it like working in radio, I mean, I haven't been doing it for very long, but I definitely have this sense that we're all kind of like waiting for someone else to do it. Like we yeah. all think that like, you know what I mean? Like some, like yeah. we all know what's going to happen, but, and we're all like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of people I could think of who would be involved, but we're all just like waiting. But for sure, when that does happen, that's going to be huge for, uh, I mean, that's going to be huge for the music scene in Montreal. Like, I think that's going to completely, um, completely change the game. Like, it's just going to be incredible. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, I want to give you all an opportunity to let people know like how they can connect with you, how they can follow you, promo anything. I told you, Patrick, your song Limelight has been on repeat. So like I was listening to it all day today. It's so good. Like you want to talk about you want to talk about a song that when I hear it, I'm like, there's no way this guy's not from Toronto. Like <laughs> this song, like moody like kind of melodic like hip-hop like sort yeah. of vibes like it's such a good song yeah. um but yeah uh, adriel and uh and steve let uh, let everyone know how they can like connect with you or follow you stuff like that go ahead adriel <laughs> yeah um the cool table we have we go live every wednesday um like i said we play new music the cool table live on instagram and the cool table live on youtube we do interviews with artists and we challenge them to finish a tub of ice cream before the end of the conversation. My main man, Patrick, has been on the show. He knows all about this ice cream challenge. Um, uh -huh. we, yeah, we got new episodes coming every single week. We just started doing um, interviews in person again. So the cool table live on YouTube to check out those. And then my personal Instagram is adrosmiley.com. And that's where you can find all the episodes of the cool table as well. Cool. Uh, well, you can you can follow me uh, on IG. It's uh, anodaj Seven, so it's A N O D A J A Y Seven. That's my artist name. I just kept it, you know. <laughs> and uh, you can follow Septième Ciel. Uh, it's uh, Seven I E M E C I E A uh, E L. Um, you can follow, or you we have the website where, uh, and I work with. A lot of artists, um, like I said, Zach, Zoya, um, Corias, Fouki, Alatlar Ensemble, uh, Shrees, uh, Dramatic. I got, we got about 20, uh, 20 artists we work with. So, yeah, check it out. And then uh, I'm looking forward to a meeting with you guys and maybe have a conversation and, and start this radio. <laughs> Uh, for me, you can follow me. Everything is X10PK, X10PK. Um, When's the album definitely coming? Go. Man, the album I'm, I'm working on now, I just need to get it. Because you know what's funny? Adriel, Adriel, <laughs> Adriel gets unreleased music, and he's like my, like my, uh, like a confidant to give me like, yo, this one? Yeah, this? Nah. So um, album, I haven't had a set day for it, but it's called Endless Summer. I've been conceptualizing it for the last two years. Um, I want to make it more of an experience than just like a, like put it out there and listen to it. But like I said, I'm hoping to get a couple of uh, Francophone, Anglophone artists on there to add a little bit of a bit of sauce, uh, diversity to what I already have going on. Um, but yeah, like definitely keep streaming Limelight. I'm going to be dropping a video tomorrow as well. And um, just prepping to, to continue to see roll out music, you know? So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, everyone who's come and listened to this. Thank you so, so much to all of the panelists, Patrick, Adriel, Steve. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, for taking the time. This was a really um, interesting conversation, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to get, like, it's being recorded, and it's going to be uh, on YouTube. So I know I'm going to be sending this to people, and, like, I think uh, I think this was fantastic. So unless anyone, like, Francella or anyone from Fourth Space has anything to say, um, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to th say thank you as well. Thanks, Megan, for yeah moderating this great conversation. And thanks to our panelists. Um, and yes, the recording will be available on our YouTube after um, soon. Yeah. So and, the, and this was this was broadcast on air on air on CJLO, right? It was. Yes. Okay. So people could tune in and listen. Okay. I just thought that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to with that, I think we're going to close up the Zoom. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day.
Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.